get into it. Hallelujah. Yes, I'm so excited to, to see Derek, to hear that testimony. And thank God we've been praying for you, Derek, for a long time. Because uh, of all the people that had been in the potter's house, it's you that we hadn't seen in a long time. But we're glad that you have come. And the others have been coming. You are here. The rest of who are in the potter's house are not here today. But we also thank God that Brian and Derek are here. And God is still at work. Amen. Bible says, go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, let's keep going, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. Let's continue. How long will you slumber or sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? Verse 10. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. Then finally, verse 11. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. You want us to be wise. You want us to be men and women that are going to make a difference in our generation. Lord, we thank you because the wisdom is in your word. I pray that you will speak to us and change our lives. Help us to become all that you want us to be as individuals, as families, as a church, Lord, even as a nation. We give you praise and we worship you. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Last Sunday we looked at four things about ants. Now, ants are very small creatures, but God has put them there to teach us lessons. And uh, one of the things we said is that ants don't have to be told what to do. They don't have a king, they don't have a ruler, they don't have a captain, but they do what they're expected to do. And that is called having initiative, having a passion, having a drive where you don't have to be reminded to do what you are expected to do, but you are able to get up every day as your own boss. That even if you have a boss, or you have someone who is overseeing you, they don't have to be over, looking over your shoulder every time to see if you have done your work. There is something that is within you that drives you to work. And many times I say that that ability to work without being pushed is what many of us lack. And the reason we lack it is because we have come to a place where we think that work is a curse. Work is something that we just have to do to earn a living. Work is something that if we had a choice, we would not do. But we have to change our understanding of work and realize that work is the means that God has put there for us to extract what he has already put within us. Every one of us has so much wealth that God has put in you. But, but that wealth is not going to come out of you unless you work. You've got to be able to get the, you know, the, the shovel and get the, the hole and get, you know, whatever you need to till your garden. Well, that's where we started from the other week. Before, when God created the man, Genesis 2.15, he planted a garden for him. And in verse 18, the Bible says, and he put him in 
the garden. So chapter, verse 15, sorry. He put him in the garden and he put him there to keep it, to guard it, and to tend to it. And we said the word tend means manage. It means administer. Whatever you do not manage, you lose it. Whatever you cannot be a steward of goes through your hands. So many times we blame other people, but it's because we have not been able to manage well what God has given to us. Are we together? So for us to be like ants, we have to have that initiative to realize we don't have to wait on somebody to give us what we need. We must go out there and create the opportunities we are looking for. I was thinking about this even before uh, I get into what I'm going to share today. Let me just speak a little bit more about this thing of the ants. <coughs> Sorry. When the ants uh, need food, when the ants need food for, the, for, for their summer, as the Bible says, they, they go out there, no ruler, no captain, and they're able to get it. And so last Sunday we talked about your I can, asking God to restore or to heal you from anything that says I cannot. Because the Bible says, when Paul is writing, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So, Christ strengthens us, but it is you to do. Amen? Christ will strengthen you, but you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe that you can. You have to be able to say, I can do this. I can pass this exam. I can run this business. I can do this. I can keep my marriage. I can. There has to be that belief in you. And when you say, I can, then Christ will strengthen you. But a lot of people have lost their I can ability. And I say it, we are all created the same. Whether you're created as a white or Asian or black or, you know, or brown. We are all the same. Everything, we're all created in the image and in the likeness of God. And who knows that there's nothing God cannot do. So God is a creator. So he also made us creative people. He did not give us ready-made items. He did not make chairs for us. He just gave us trees. He did not, you know, make uh, cupboards for us. He just gave us trees. But see what men have been able to do. Look around and you can see that the human brain is so powerful. In fact, I read something that was amazing. They said most human beings, including those we call geniuses, who are so, so, you know, smart. Most of us, by the time we die, I don't know who, who measured this, but they said we've only used... 0.1% of our brain's capacity. That means there is 99.9. .9. It's like a phone. You know, a phone has all these apps and it can do amazing things. But most of us, you know, especially the older generation, all we know is just to call, receive calls, and maybe WhatsApp, and that's it. But it could do, ah, I mean, so many things. But a phone is very, I mean, it's, it's nothing compared to what your brain can do. That's why David says, I am fearfully and wonderfully met. So, 
harnessing the power of your brain and waking up. And, and you know, I like what I was thinking about this morning is this. The more there is crisis, the more opportunity there is. If you live in a neighborhood where people lack a lot of things, guess what? You have an opportunity to do the smallest business and still succeed. If you live in a place where people don't have much money, you have an opportunity to start making money with selling very small things. But many times we look at ourselves and you say, I don't have what it takes. I don't have. This is when now we get the initiative. The ants have no captain. They have no ruler. They have no overseer. There is nobody telling them, go and, and work. Wake up. Do this. But <coughs> they have that drive. They have that initiative. So I pray that God will restore the drive. Amen? Whatever killed your drive, I say there are three things that normally change, make us different from others. And those three things I say are what? Exposure, education, and the environment. The reason a child, say, who was raised in the U.S. thinks differently is just because of the environment. Even if you go in the U.S. itself, for those who have traveled and maybe been in such places, you will still find beggars there. You still find people who are living on the street. So their environment has now been overtaken by the education that they have received. Remember, education is not what, what you get in school. It's the things that you acquire as you go along life. Someone tells you you cannot make it. Someone tells you because you're black, you cannot succeed. Someone tells you, oh, this is education. And the more you listen to these lies and receive them, they can cripple you. Are we together, church? They can cripple you. You can be in a place of so much opportunity and only see lack. You can look, two of us can look at the same glass as they say, which is half. And one will see it half empty, and the other one will see it half full. One will see no hope. The other one will see countless opportunities. That's why people are coming to Africa, and people are, we are crying that there's so much poverty in our country. People come to Africa, and they say there is no better place to make money than Africa. I was talking to a certain Indian. I think I've ever shared this here before. I was on a flight coming from Burundi. And I sat with this Indian man who was coming through Kenya and going on to the parents who are taking him, have taken him to study in Canada. And he's, he was telling me that he prefers Burundi than any other place on earth. And I thought he's joking. So he tells me the story. This young man... Uh, they were, Burundi, remember the time he was raised in Burundi, it was a time when there was war. So he said they would go to school, sometimes there would be, be uh, bullets flying around, but in the midst of the war, their father came from India with nothing. This is the story this guy is telling me. He said he came from India with nothing. Nothing. Meaning like he just came, he you know, he was even struggling. To, probably all he had was just enough maybe to rent a place. He comes to Burundi. All he sees is opportunities. He's seeing these people don't have this. They don't have this. They don't have this. He was able to build. Of course, it took time. It took so many years. I think over a period of about 30, 40 years, he's now a multi-millionaire. And all the money he's made, he's made it in Burundi. And he's trained his children. So the boy was telling me, I'm going to Canada just to school, but as soon as I'm done with school, I'm not going to look for a job in Canada. I have to come back to Burundi. Because that's where my father made money from. That is the life I know. And I listened to this guy, and he told me, you know, what most people don't realize, and I mean, I've never 
sat down with someone who is very candid. Because he tells me a lot of Africans don't realize that Africa is the only place where you can start a small business. It's the only place left in the world where you can come with your 20,000, 10,000, even 5,000 and still start. He says, every other place on earth, Asia, that's why he says, that's why Indians are coming. Because they know with the little money they have, they cannot start a business in India. They will not be able to start anything and sell to anyone. But they know they will come and start here. And they will be able to build on that. Are you trying to see what I'm saying? Unless you, 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 you realize that opportunities are around you, you will continue blaming everyone. And that's what the wisdom of the ant is. It has no captain. It has no ruler. It has no overseer. But it still makes it. So God has already given us such a prosperous country. I mean, for me, what breaks my heart is to see how much money we have borrowed and has been stolen. It disturbs me. It disturbs me. And I pray, my prayer really has been that God will, will deal with the issue of corruption. Because it's not that we are poor. It's that money is coming and it's being used by a few to enrich themselves, leaving people broken. But that shows you how much potential we have. That's what on the flip side you realize that you know what? There's potential in this nation. Because so much has been stolen, but the country is still here. So, the Bible says that uh, initiative... That <coughs> Sorry. The other thing we looked at, I just want to quickly look, go through this, is uh, they work with purpose, so they know they have to get food. Then number three, we say that they have teamwork. They realize they are too small to do anything. And that's what I also talked about last week. We, we can never do much on our own. We are too small to do anything on our own. And then finally, they have learned how to invest. So they know when it is summer, winter is coming. So they prepare. Today, I want us to look at the last, those last two verses. Or well, rather, last three verses. Why does the Bible connect? Because every time you're reading the Bible, you actually are supposed to remember that the Bible is never written with chapters and verses. So the Bible is a continuous uh, text. Okay? So for you to understand a scripture, it is good for you to look at the verses before that scripture and also look at the verses after. So I want us to quickly look at, um, at the, the, a few verses that come before this story of the ants and also the verses after. And when you read verse 4, it says, Give not sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself as a rope from the hand of the hunter, and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. Now, it's talking about, from verse 1, it is talking about being a surety for a friend or guaranteeing someone. Okay? So you realize that the whole chapter is really about transactions. It's about finances. Uh, but then when you move on, on verse 10, he talks about, verse 9 says, how long will you sleep? So the point here. I want us to realize it is not just about talking about physical sleep because we need to rest, yeah? Rest is important. But what he is talking about here is when you forget to take care of what you have. So today I want to talk about something called potential. 
potential. And I know I've already talked a little bit about it. But I want now to see how do we unlock that potential. Because it's one thing to tell you, oh, God has already given you everything. You have in it. But how? How do I start? Where do I start? How do I begin, you know, to unlock this potential? How do I rise up from this place where I am? And become different. Now, we have already said it's going to take work. So, number one is what? It's work. So, let me give you, I'm going to give you four principles that will help us unlock our potential. Number one, you've, there are certain, you've got to stop doing certain things. Or let me put it like this. You've got to have a not to do list. Amen? A not to do? Some of you don't understand. Most of us know a to do list, isn't it? Where you say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Now you need to go back and write a not to do list. There are certain things you have to stop doing. And you need to know clearly what those things are. What is, whatever you have been doing is what has brought you to where you are. Can you agree? It is not what you have not been doing. It is the things you have been doing that have brought you to where you are. So if you want to change your situation, you have to stop doing. You have to destroy certain habits and create new habits. Many of us talk about what I'm going to do, but until you break the wrong foundations, you will not be able to build new foundations. That's why, I, you know, unless we break the culture of corruption in our country, it's going to be very hard to build this nation. So there is a foundation of corruption, a foundation where people think they can get things for free, you know, without working, where people can cheat, people can deceive. So there, there are certain things that must be broken. Amen? And that is what Christ came to do. You don't do it in your own strength. Whatever we are, we are, you're calling, you're not to do least. You're not going to, to break those habits, break those patterns, break those cycles in your own strength. You have to ask God to help you. Do you know some cycles have been built over generations? There are certain things that are holding you back from succeeding, from being prosperous, but it's not your fault. It is really something that came from another generation that has been passed down. They told you, this is how you live. You are Mukamba, this is how Bakamba, or Wakamba do things. You are Luo, this is how we Luo do things. But that culture is not godly. That culture is demonic. And it is what has introduced poverty in your family. And you have to say, you have to start interrogating the things that you do and the way you think according to the word of God. Is this what God says I'm supposed to do? If it is not of God, then stop doing it. Amen? So have a not to do list. And say from this point, I'm going to stop this. Let me, let me share my personal experience. When I, when I got into ministry, when I started, you know, preaching full time, I had my fears. And I've been told about, you know, pastors and the struggles. And, and so I, 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 I thought that one of the ways to make it in ministry is, uh, 
develop a list of partners and, uh, you know, call these partners, tell them about your problems, get them to, to support the work. So when I started out, I started out, you know, I'm going to list, and some of you have already shared this with you. When I started out, I wrote down a list of people that I knew, 50 people, that all of them, I thought, in my mind, I thought these are my friends. When I was working, we used to have coffee with them. And, and so I wrote down a list, sent messages to them. Out of the 50, only four responded. And out of those four, only one person said, that we're going to support you. That was the first shocker. So after that, I started, uh, God opened the door. I tra started traveling. And the first time I went to travel, I went to a conference. I printed business cards, gave out business cards to as many people. This was a big conference for business people. It was a Christian businessmen conference somewhere in Asia. And not a single person responded. Another shocker. Another, so after that, I kept on, you know, every month I would write devotionals, send them out to people. And one time, and sometimes we learn lessons in a very hard way. There's this particular person, up to now she's still a very good friend and, you know, many times God uses her to, to bless us. But she's the one who, who wrote a very strong message back to me. Says, the way you're writing these messages, it's like you're begging. That was hard. It says, you have to remember, if God called you, he's able to supply your needs. So learn to pray and believe God for your needs. If not, go find a job. I say this woman is so heartless. You know. But you know, I got that message. I said, God, if you have called me into the ministry, you're going to provide for me. You're going to provide for me. And, and, and I stopped. I stopped writing those messages. I would panic. I would get into panic mode. You know, you have a need. Maybe the rent is coming. You get into panic mode. And you write these messages and you're telling people, oh, please help. It's like if they don't help, the world is going to come to an end. And the moment I started now to learn to trust God, God began to raise people. God raised, God is amazing. I mean, I think about the 20 years we've been in ministry and we've never failed to pay rent. I don't know how, but it takes God. But there, there, is a, there was an understanding are we together? So I stopped doing that. Your, your, to, your not to do list could be something else, but there could be something you're doing that is crippling you. I mean, I could dwell on this. Look at this man uh, who was on the Get Beautiful. And every person he sees, he just what? Hands out his hand. Please give me, please give me. But he finds a new, a different kind of group. This is Peter and John. For them, they have nothing. But they look at him and say, silver and gold, we don't have. So he must have at that point said, so then why, why are you wasting my time? <laughs> you know? But they said, there is something that we have. And that we will give to you. And I believe sometimes that's what God is telling us. There is something that you can receive that can now take you out of being crippled and cause you to begin to become productive. Say, Lord, give me that. Because as long as someone is just giving you, giving you, and that is sometimes what has crippled us as Africa, we're just handing out our hand, give us, give us, give us. And these people come here, they establish factories, they establish businesses, they do things, then they give us a little bit out of the same money, small percentage of what they already made out of our country. And they call it eight. And we clap our hands. May the Lord deliver us. So develop a not-to-do list. Number two, discover who you are. Amen? Discover who you are. 
if you do not know who you are, if you do not know your name, this is something I had from someone and I liked it. It says, if you do not know who you are, you don't know your name, you will always answer to whatever people call you. Think about it. If you do not know who you are, you will answer. People call you this, you answer. People call you this. But if, if I know who, you, who I am, if I know my name, if you call Michael, I will not answer. Because I'm not Michael, I'm Andrew. You get what I'm saying? So you've got to know who you are. And, and we have, for us to unlock that potential, you cannot unlock what you do not know. Amen? Know who you are and how, and that's why we need the Bible. Get into the word of God. Re-educate yourself. I like what somebody said that many times we think we need to learn, but many times we actually need to unlearn. Because whatever we, we have learned living in those uh, you know, communities or living in that neighborhood or living in that family is what has crippled us. So we have to ask God, help me to unlearn certain things. That's why the Bible puts it in a better way. Do not be conformed to the standards of the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That means we cannot prove the will of God. We won't even be able to hear the will of God if we do not know who we are in Christ. If we are still conform, the word conform means squeeze. It means like you have a, a, a square rod and you are forcing it into a round hole. And the world wants to push us. He wants to squeeze us. Wants to cause us to think a certain way. To do things a certain way. And you have to get to a place where you say, this is not me. I am now a child of God. I am now redeemed. The word of God says I am this. I'm going to live according to the word of God. I have discovered who I am. Praise the Lord. He's saying, Pastor, is there a scripture for that? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 25. And we're going to see Moses. The Bible says when Moses, Hebrews 11, 25. Please get it to, for me very quickly. When Moses, let's verse 24. When Moses... Became, by faith, Moses, when he became of age. Someone say, I need to become of age. How do you become mature? You grow in the word of God. You grow in the understanding of who God is and his love for you. When Moses became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Can you imagine? This is a man raised in the palace. A man with all these opportunities. A man with all these privileges. But when he matured, the Bible says he refused. So they call him and he says, no, this is not me. They must, it, for some of people, it might have felt offensive. They're like, what does, why, how can he all of a sudden say we are, I'm not his mother? He says, no, I know who I am. I know who I am. I know we sing that song a lot, you know. I know who I am. But I pray that we really know who we are. Because the moment we know who we are, there are certain things we will refuse to be called. Amen? Just because you live in this neighborhood doesn't give anyone the right to call you this. Just because you are this color of the skin doesn't give anyone a right to call you this. 
So you, you get to a place where you say, this is not who I am. The Bible tells me, the Bible says, I'm blessed in the country and in the city. I'm blessed wherever I go. The Bible says, I can make it. I can do all things. So you begin, you change, you know what? You begin to change that narrative that has been spoken over you. The Bible talks about blind Bartimaeus. The moment Jesus called him, the Bible says the first thing he did, even before he became, he began to see, he threw away the garment of beggars. He threw it away. He, he says, I cannot go to Jesus believing that I'm going to be healed and I'm still wearing a beggar's garment. And so there, there are certain things where you say, I refuse to be called this. I refuse to be called poor. That's why the Bible says, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. It begins in your mind. It begins in your mind. You can't just sit back and keep blaming and keep pitying yourself. You, begin, you need to lift yourself up and say, I am not this. I may have grown up in this neighborhood. I may have been raised by this kind of parents, but I refuse to be called this. And the moment you begin to change what you say about yourself, you begin to change, you begin to say, this is who I am. It begins on the inside before it manifests on the outside. I mean, I am telling you what I live, what I have seen happen in my own life. Amen? And people can tell if you have a low self-esteem. People can tell if you don't know who you are. People, and people will treat you the way you present yourself. If you're always timid, if you're always scared, you know, you get before people. People can read this person is insecure. People can read this person doesn't feel happy. People can, but if you're confident, and many times your confidence is just the way you walk, the way you, you talk. You know, I've, I've been, uh, like, you know, Americans train their children. In fact, that reminds me, we're going to have a men's, uh, a men's fellowship uh, the first Saturday of this coming month. We'll meet here in the morning and I want us to watch a movie together as men and remind every other man. I know we'll talk about it the next Sunday because it's going to be the other, ma the other Saturday. Uh, it's called The Forge and I was watching it with my family and, and I realized one thing. Some of you have watched it and, but they, they talk about how this man who was mentoring this young man looks at him and, and he tells him, and next time you're greeting me, look me straight in the face. Shake my hand like this. There are certain things we give out without even knowing. Because you, you, you've, you've all your life, you've been feeling, I am weak. I'm nothing. I'm this. When you meet someone who could change your life, you project the same thing. Oh, praise the Lord. So know who you are. Number three. Embrace the process. Amen? Embrace the process. Potential does not just come out. Potential is unlocked. If you want to enjoy the potential of grapes, you squeeze them. Okay? If you want to get perfume out of flowers, you crush them. If you want olive oil out of the olives, they are crushed. That, there is a process called pain. There is a process called affliction that is, you have to go through to produce what God wants you to be. So you and I, we, I know we don't like pain. I, don't know, I know we don't like discomfort. We don't like inconvenience, but... The good news is, or rather the bad news, whatever you want to call it, you cannot unlock potential without a process. It is just impossible. So you just get used to it. There has to be some pain in breaking out of that cocoon. Amen? It is a process God has put in life. So as you choose to be different, some people are not going to like it. Some people are going to oppose you. As you choose to break the habits, those old friends are, not, are, going, are going to look at you in a weird way. 
they're going to try to pull you back. As you try to change your life, make your life better, people are going to discourage you. There's going to be opposition. That's all part of the process. But if you don't have a mindset of embracing the process, you'll give up. So you have to choose. I want us to go to the next verse, Hebrews 11, 25. This is what Moses knew. He knew, I am refusing to be called this. This is who I am. I know who I am. But now, I have to choose to suffer affliction. Walking out of the palace was not going to be easy. But he says, if this is what it takes, I'm going all the way. I am going all the way. I'm not going back to a mediocre life. I'm not going back to a, you know, an average life. I am going to do whatever it takes to be this part of the people of God. He knew who he was. The system was very, had accommodated him. He was, they knew he was a Hebrew, but they had accepted him as one of them. But he said, I am, this is not me. And he says, because I want to be known as a child of God, as one of the people of God, I am going to suffer affliction. It's going to, it is part of my process. It is part of my journey. Friends, the moment we choose to stand for God, to stand for righteousness, to stand for holiness, to stand for the things of God, there's going to be opposition. But there must be a people who say, I refuse to be part of the crowd. I'm going to stand out of the crowd. That's why I always like this quote that I had from Ron Luce many, many years ago. He says, it is the people who the world cannot change that will change the world. It is the people the world cannot change that will change the world. As long as we are still among the crowd, we are still fitting in with everybody. We want everybody to be our friend. We want everybody to, to please, to be our friend, to please everybody. Then we are not going to be counted among the people of God. We are not going to be counted among those who are making a difference. But we must step out and say, I know it is going to cause me some pain. There is going to be pain for a season. But I would rather suffer affliction in the right place than enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. And that's a choice we have to do as young people. Those of you who are still younger, it's a choice. You lay the right foundation. Say, I would rather suffer laying this foundation than do what everybody is doing and end up having a faulty foundation that will bring problems to me in the future and problems to my children because foundations never lie. You can lie about anything else, but if a foundation is wrong, it's a matter of time. So you better take your time carefully examining your foundation. What am I building? Is it going to last for generations to come? Amen? And part of that is embracing the process. We talked about not to do this. There are certain things you're going to say, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. Not because it is not popular. No, it's because I now know who I am. But let us feel it. You unlock potential by going through pain. Many things we like in life would never be even that tree we are talking about, for it to become a chair, imagine what happens to that wood. You know, if it could speak, it would tell us, I don't want to be, you know, to put, to start hitting me and, and, and you know, doing all these things to me. But, we've, but beauty cannot come out until it is taken through the process. So there's a process, my friend, that God is leading us through. It is not easy. We don't like it. But God says for me to bring out the best. Just allow me to take you day by day. Because there is a shortcut. But shortcuts are all, always dangerous as they say. There are always shortcuts. Even in ministry there are shortcuts. There are lots of things people can do to get crowds. And to get people coming. And to get excitement 
and to hype up people and to do all kinds of things. But God is saying, if you want to follow me, just allow me to lead you. And, and I don't know about you, but I've said, God, whatever it is you want to do, I'm ready. I know you have showed me multitudes, you have so, showed me thousands, but if I have to pastor 10 people, 20 people for the next 10 years, this is what you have led me through. As long as you give me the grace, and this is what is going to make me have the capacity to handle the multitudes when they come, it is well. Let's go. Let's keep going. Praise the Lord. As long as you keep paying the rent, as long as you keep doing everything, we are going with you. We are not in a hurry. We are not chasing anyone. We are not competing with anyone. We will go at your pace. And there is so much peace in that. There is so much peace that wants me to be. Amen. And then finally, We're still at, on Hebrews, looking at these steps. We've talked about, no, so Moses knew who he was. Moses refused to be called, amen? So he stopped doing that. He chose to suffer affliction. Let's look at verse 26. So we're going to look at the last thing. If we're going to, it says, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. And the last thing is for he looked toward the reward. What is going to give you the ability to go through pain? What is going to give you the ability to keep going? You must have a vision. And I know we've talked about this, but you must be able to see something that is bigger than your present pain. You must be able to see something that is bigger than your present struggle. You must, and that's why I talked about last Sunday, God has to sanctify our imagination. Amen? You, you have to begin to dream big. To believe God for big things. You have to give yourself room to just have those wild imaginations. Because God is able to do exceeding abundantly, far above what we can ask, think, or even imagine. So the limit, our limit is really what we ask, how we think, and what we imagine. Have you ever thought about that? God is able to do beyond what we ask, think, or even imagine. So if we don't ask, we limit him. If we don't think, we limit him. If we can't imagine, we limit him. So may God sanctify your imagination. I shared with you an example. A child, any child, wherever you find them, even if they are born on the street, they have a wild imagination. They believe they can be anything. They believe they can do anything. But somewhere... Along the way, reality kicks in. They begin, what they call reality now kicks in. They realize, huh, at this age, I don't think it is too late. You know, I, I, with this kind of family, it is too late. With this kind of education, no. But who told you that you have a God who is able to restore the years that have been stolen? But you have to begin to believe him. Amen? Or oh, am I speaking to somebody? And that is called vision. What do you see? If God is going to change your life, he has to change what you see. Amen. When it comes to Jeremiah, we don't have time to read that portion. But in Jeremiah, God comes to Jeremiah, chapter 1 and verse 12. And he looks at him and says, Jeremiah, what do you see? He's already told him, before you were born, I anointed you, I called you, I ordained you to be a prophet. But then in verse 12 says, what do you see? And Jeremiah says, I see, chapter 1 and verse 12, I see a branch of an almond tree. And God says, you have seen well. Amen? That means if you don't see well, there's a problem. It says, you have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. 
So what you see can hinder what God will do. Moses, Moses' eyes were opened to see the reward. Maybe you don't have the passion, you don't have the, 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 the but it's because of what you've not been able to see. Ask God, God give me a second touch. You know, you might be like that man who when he sees men, he sees trees. And he comes back to you and says, Lord, I need a second touch. Tell God, God, I, I, I know you saved me, but I still see things, they are not clear. Help me to see. He looked at the reward. He looked at the reward. And the reward was enough to motivate him to walk away from the palace. The reward was enough to motivate him to go through the affliction. The reward was enough to motivate him to go through the wilderness. The reward was enough to motivate him to go through reproach and suffering for so many years because he was able to see beyond the present. You must have a vision that is bigger than what you're going through. And I can tell you, church, if it wasn't for what God showed me and he has kept showing me, I would have given up on this church. I wouldn't be standing here preaching. I could have walked away. But every time God reminds me, this is the reward. This is where I'm taking you. This is the vision. The lives that are going to be healed. People that are going to be saved. People that are going to be set free in Westlands. People from every kind of place that nobody else would have reached, but only Impact Church will. And the more I think about that, I get excited. Why? Because there is a reward. Whoever comes to God must know that he is and he's a rewarder. Amen? So we are looking at these ants and we are, I want to summarize it like this. The Bible talks about a little sleep, a little slumber. When you sleep, you cannot see. When you sleep, you will not know who you are. When you are asleep, you will not, you will not, there are things you will not be able to cancel out of your life. And many of us are in a deep sleep. The devil has put you in such a deep slumber that everybody else is moving on. Life is going on. Things are going on, but you're asleep. I pray that the Lord wakes you up. It is time to wake up. It is time to put to work what God has put in us. It is time not to be hopeless. The Bible says a living dog is greater than a dead lion. As long as you're still alive, it means God has a plan for your life. Hallelujah. I want us to rise up on our feet right now. I want to talk to God and say, God, I want you to, whatever it is, I don't know what God has been speaking to you. I've, I've said so many things. But I know in such a sermon, God is speaking different things to different people. What God has spoken to your heart, just begin to talk to God. It doesn't have to be a long prayer. Just call to God and say, God, it could be vision. God, help me to receive, to be called, I mean to refuse to be called this. It could be whatever it is. Wake me up from the sleep. Wake me up from the slumber. Wake me up from hopelessness. Wake me up from these habits. Give me the strength to stop doing A, B, C, D. Whatever it is, come and just take a moment. Talk to God. Talk to God. The, re the reason we preach is that your life will be transformed. It's not for you to go back and say, oh, that was a great sermon. Oh, I was very excited. No, it is that you can call upon God and say, God, I want you to change my life. Wakini ta 
the sound.